Let us pray. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, establish the Paschal mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Our first reading is from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see, those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way, but the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away, and who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living, and smitten for the sin of his people. A grave was assigned him among the wicked, and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong, nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light and fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord.
second reading is a reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he had suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus. 
he said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who was the gatekeeper said to Peter, He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gathered. And in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. And if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium in the morning. And they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out and said to them, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said indicating the kind of death he would die, 
So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own? Or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again. Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged, and the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, And they struck him repeatedly. Once more, Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, and he said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and the Greeks have a law, and the Jews have a law. Now, when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him, so Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you, and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed him over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gab Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, then he handed him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus, the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic 
but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top down. So they said to one another, In order that the passage of the scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did, standing by the cross of Jesus, were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there, whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine, so they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Now, since it was the preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of the week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other, one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you may also come to believe. For this happened, so that the scripture passages might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, They will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted him. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. It was in the year 312 that a pagan woman in Rome named Helena decided to become a Christian. It was a dangerous time to be a Christian. Only seven years before, the Emperor Diocletian had unleashed the worst persecution of the ten trying to wipe out the Christian religion. Helena had been abandoned by her husband, who wanted to become the Roman Emperor, and he was told to get rid of her. She was too ordinary, not connected to the right families in Rome. 
And so fortunately her son Constantine was faithful to her and took care of her. He too was a general in the Roman army, guarding the defenses of the Roman Empire along the Rhine River. And so it was that she talked with her son about her decision to become a Christian. Perhaps she talked with him because it might be embarrassing for him as a Roman general. She must have talked about Jesus and the mystery of his cross. Because in the same year that she became a Christian, Constantine made his move to become the next Roman emperor. And he claimed to have seen a vision in the sky, the cross, and hearing the words in hoc signo vinces, by this sign you will conquer. And so he told his soldiers as they were going into battle against his rival, Maxentius, to put the sign of the cross on their helmets and on the shields that they carried into battle. I've often wondered if many of those soldiers didn't say, are you crazy? The sign of the cross, the sign of death, the sign of defeat, the sign of despair. Why? We want to win this battle. But indeed, Constantine did win the battle at the Melvian Bridge and became the next Roman Emperor. And from that time on, the sign of the cross has indeed been a sign of victory, of, of life, of goodness. Today we come celebrating the cross that is at the center of our Catholic and Christian lives. How often we make the sign of the cross, perhaps barely thinking about what we're doing. Years ago, I often used to go to a Trappist monastery for my annual retreat in the hills of the Shenandoah Valley. And I was always impressed every day when the monks came into the chapel to pray one of the five hours of the liturgy. And when the abbot, who's now deceased, came into that chapel and made the sign of the cross, it was as if it was the first time he had ever made it. I always found myself looking, watching. He made that sign of the cross so many thousands of times, and yet every time he did it with devotion, with an awareness of how important it is to us as Christians. Yes, it is the cross that was the sign of death and defeat and disgrace that has now become for us the sign of victory, the sign of hope, the sign of life, we worship the cross today, we venerate it, and we know that for us too, as we embrace the cross and carry it in our own lives, indeed it will be for us the road to glory, to eternal life. During the solemn intercessions, you may choose to stand or to remain seated. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, 
that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her, and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading a life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God, the Father Almighty. Almighty and ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church, spread throughout all the world, may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our most holy father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God.
and united in the bond of charity. Through Christ our Let us pray also for the Jewish people, to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants. Graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty and ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with sincere heart, they may find the striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest. Grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you. And so in gladness confess you the one true God and Father of our human race through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those in public office that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of people, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and freedom of religion, may through your gift be made secure through Christ our Lord. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty ever-living God, 
comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil. May the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand. Through Christ our Lord. This year, Pope Francis and our bishops have added one additional prayer. Let us pray for the people of Ukraine and in all war zones of the world, for those who have fled the horrors of violence and have been deprived of their homes, for all women and men who stand up with their lives to ward off evil, and to protect the weak and the persecuted. <clears throat> Almighty ever-living God, you have compassion for the lowly and the poor, but you cast down our oppressors as you guided Israel out of slavery in Egypt, so in our days, save all victims of war and violence, change the hearts of evildoers, and let peace be victorious. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Today, throughout the world, Catholic churches take up the collection for the Holy Land to help the church minister to the small Christian community still in the land where Jesus lived, died, and rose. That collection is now taken up.
please turn to page 124 and turn to the back of the church. Page 124.
Savior's command, formed by divine teaching, we dare to say,
Thank you. 